Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you into our Bible study tonight. Uh, as we uh, begin tonight, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. We want to invite all of our folks that are tuning in by Facebook and will tune in by Facebook tonight. We invite you to join us here in this Bible study this evening. We're continuing in our Sermon on the Mount series. We've entitled Kingdom um, Life. Tonight we're going to be talking about kingdom priorities. Uh, in the kingdom priorities, we have talked about the priority of giving. We have talked about the priority of prayer. Uh, and as Jesus said, when you give, uh, he goes on a little later in his sermon. And he says, and when you pray... And we have been talking about, since last week, we've been talking about uh, Jesus' third duty as kingdom disciples, when you fast. And we're talking about the kingdom priority of fasting. And we're going to pick that up this evening as we, um, as we go to the Lord in prayer. We want to pray for all of our folks that are sick, those that aren't able to be here tonight, those that are at home, if you have a prayer need uh, we we stand uh, always on the truth of God's word. The Bible says that he knows what we need before we ask, before we think. Uh, God knows what I need. He knows what we're dealing with, what we're frustrated with, what we're in pain about. He knows all those things. And so tonight we can just come boldly, Paul said, to the throne of grace. We can come boldly to find grace to help and mercy in our time of need. Uh, God's uh, arms are open tonight as we... Uh, as we approach him, his grace is sufficient for every need and his love, uh, of course, never fails. Uh, thank God for his love tonight. We want to pray uh, for, as I said, all of our people who are not able to be uh, in the house of the Lord or those who are sick. Um, want to pray for all of those that continue to um, deal with the coronavirus. We want to pray for uh, several churches and pastors that have had outbreaks of coronavirus across the country. We want to pray for those in California that are fighting the, the devastating fires that are ravaging uh, several communities in California. We want to remember all of those folks in prayer and just pray God's hand of grace and blessing upon them. Tonight, let's uh, join together as we pray. Before we go to the Lord in prayer, those of you who are here tonight in the sanctuary with us, does anyone have a special prayer need before we go uh, to prayer tonight? Pray for Sister Muhal's brother Ray. Pray for his, his soul, his salvation. Anyone else? All right. Let's uh, join together tonight in prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege of being here together in the house of the Lord. We thank you for your love, your grace and mercy, God, that never fails. God, in our weakness, your strength is perfected. Tonight we come before you, God, as humbly as we can, knowing, God, that every good and every perfect gift comes from the Father of lights, in whom is no barrenness, no shadow of turning. God, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, we just stand humbly before you and knowing that we are weak and you're strong. And we truly, Lord, we, uh, we stand upon the strength of your word tonight. And we ask you to guide and direct through this Bible study. I ask you to lead me, God, as we share and teach tonight. Let there be a special anointing of the Holy Spirit here tonight, Father. Because, God, you are good, you're merciful, and your grace never fails us. Thank you, Lord, for this time together in the Word. Meet those needs that were mentioned here tonight. We pray for Ray. God, we pray for his salvation. God, that you would bring salvation to his soul. And God, that his heart would be transformed by the power of your love and your grace. And God, that his eyes would be opened and his heart, God, would receive, Lord, that what you have for him. God, we pray for him tonight in the name of Jesus. We pray for all those that are sick, those that are recovering from surgeries, those that have need tonight in their body and their spirit in their mind, whatever the need might be. We pray for those at home tonight listening via Facebook. We just pray, God, that you would minister healing and touch them, touch their homes, touch our families tonight across this city, across this world. God, we pray for our homes and families. God, minister through the power of your word now as we surrender ourselves. God, as servants of a righteous God who loves us and died for us. Thank you, Father, tonight for your goodness. In Christ's name, amen. And amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to see all of you here tonight with us. We want to get right into the Bible study. Before we do, I'll just remind you that you can give tonight as you leave. Uh, Brother Northern or Brother Greg 
will be out uh, at the back of the sanctuary as you leave this evening. Those of you who are at home watching via Facebook, we invite you to join in giving and our worship and giving online. Go to our website, evangelcogdayton.org, and there you'll find the stewardship link, and we invite you to join there and give. And many of you have, and we want to say tonight we appreciate everyone's faithfulness in giving. And we just, uh, in the last few days, we have recently, over this past week, found out that we're having to replace an entire furnace and air conditioner here in the church. And uh, we had to repair a part of another air, one of our uh, air conditioners. So uh, that's, uh, that's quite an expense. So uh, we appreciate your faithfulness. Your faithfulness helps us take care of those things without coming to you with, with special needs and special occasions. And you're faithful. And God, most of all, is faithful. And he supplies our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So thank you tonight. Please give. Please help us as God blesses you. Bless the kingdom of God. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 16. Jesus, in continuing his Sermon on the Mount, uh, next week we will finish chapter 6 and likely move into chapter 7, the last third of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, this sermon that Jesus gave as, uh, gives us in these three chapters of the Bible is quite, quite an extensive theological uh, work. The, I know it's three chapters. It doesn't seem that long. Uh, I know we've been studying it for a few weeks now. But the truth of the matter is, there's such power in the words that Jesus used. Uh, it was the thing that set Jesus apart. It was the thing that made Jesus distinctive from all the other uh, prophets that, that the people have heard, all the other teachers, the rabbis. The thing that made Jesus so different, so distinct, was that when he spoke, the words that he spoke carried such weight and such authority. Even the, the scripture writer records that they, they said of Jesus that he speaks with such authority. And that, that authority had to do with the, the supernatural power of God that was upon his words. And the reason is because they are so theologically profound. They're so deep that the words don't just touch and, and, and speak to surface things. But the words that Jesus speaks, when he speaks in the New Testament, his words are filled with, with biblical truth and, and theology and just time after time after time such profound kingdom principles that Jesus speaks. Uh, even and, and the scripture even says if the things that he spoke could really be contained, there would, would, there would not be enough volumes to contain the, the eternal truths of the things that Jesus says. And uh, I thank God tonight that we have the opportunity just to look into these three beautiful chapters. And uh, I, I'm just so appreciative of his word tonight. He says, moreover, when you fast, verse 16. So he's now in that third duty or third kingdom priority that he presents to the, the kingdom disciples as he's teaching here by the Sea of Galilee. And he says, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites. Or those who uh, are hypocritical, or those who have hypocrisy, uh, those who are insincere, those who are just doing it to be seen or to be heard. He says, of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint thine head, wash your face. That, that, that you appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Then he goes on to talk about laying not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, nor thieves do not break through or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee is be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, or 
money. Andrew, Dr. Andrew Murray wrote, and I, I love this quote from him. He wrote, prayer is reaching out to what is unseen. The, the concept of prayer is hinged upon the truth of what faith is. The writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. So when you think about faith and that faith is us reaching out to those things that are unseen, then as Brother Murray writes, he says, prayer is reaching out for what is unseen and fasting is letting go of what is seen. And that's powerful. It's powerful to understand the concept of, of fasting and prayer in conjunction. And everywhere you find it, almost everywhere you find it in the scripture, you find it uh, in conjunction or you find it together. You find them mentioned together because prayer and prayer and fasting go hand in hand. And so when we find Jesus speaking here about prayer and fasting, that Fasting is really, it's really letting go of the things that grasp our attention as we, through prayer, reach out to those things and through uh, prayer reach out to those things that we cannot see, the things we hope for, the miracles that we need, the things we haven't seen yet, but we're praying for them and we're asking God for those needs to be met and supplied and we're reaching out for that which we cannot see. And by doing, by letting go of the things we do, we are not distracted in our search for the heart and the mind of God. I appreciate that, uh, that quote tonight. We're going to pick up in our lesson as we move through the study guide that those of you who are here have. Uh, tonight we're going to talk uh, again about the truths about our bodies rel relative to what the scripture teaches about fasting. Uh, we know that, of course, fasting is doing, for the most part, most people understand fasting to be doing without food, but it can be uh, many things that we fast from or we, we literally fast something. We do without it. We stay away from it. We, it may be something that we love, something that we enjoy, something that we uh, do on a regular basis, but we're putting it aside. We're fasting it. We're putting it aside so that we can focus on the mind and the heart of God. So God, God says several things in the scripture about our bodies. Uh, first of all, we talked about our body belonging to God. That our body is the Lord's. The Bible says, Paul wrote, he says, you're not your own, but you're bought with a price. Therefore, you ought to glorify God in your mortal body, which is God's. The concept of redemption and the fact that we've been born again through the blood of Jesus Christ says that, that God redeemed us. He bought us. The word redemption means to buy back. Uh, what was sold out in the fall, you with me? What was sold out in the garden, what was sold out in the, the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, what was sold out was being, is, has been bought back through the redemption of Jesus Christ. That's what the word redemption means. Um, number two, we talked about Jesus paid for our body when he died for us on the cross. And I basically went there as we talked about that. But the Bible says we were redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ uh, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. We have been paid for uh, through the vicarious death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Number three... God's spirit dwells in my body. The Bible says, Paul wrote, he said, for we, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have the treasure of eternal life. We have the treasure of the spirit of God. As Jesus ministered to the disciples in John, and John records it on more than one occasion in his gospel St. John records this. He's, Jesus spoke much about the coming Holy Spirit. The comforter he called him. The one who was called alongside. He said when the comforter has come. When the spirit of God has come. He will not only be with you. But he, sh he shall be in you. 
In John's gospel, we read early in, in the gospel of John and Jesus with the woman at the well speaking of the Holy Spirit. He said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water, using that metaphor of, of living water, flowing water coming out of us. And he said, this spake he of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit that not only is in us and indwells us, but that is designed to flow out of us through the, through the outworking of, of the Spirit. As he works through us to accomplish the will of the Father. Isn't it wonderful to, to think that God chose to possess these earthen vessels. And to allow his Holy Spirit to operate through these, these simple clay jars we call flesh and blood. My, what a blessing. What, a, what an honor to, for the Holy Spirit to indwell us. What an honor to have the third person of the Godhead Trinity, the, the Holy Spirit, to, to indwell these clay vessels. What an honor. Uh, we know that His Spirit indwells us. And the Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're the temple. We're His dwelling place. You know, the Bible lets us know that the, the Spirit of God dwells among men. Uh, the Bible tells us that the Lord inhabits, He indwells the praises of His people. The, the idea of God's Spirit was that God not did not just want to be with men as He was in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant, but God wanted to, He said in the Old Testament in a, in a prophetic promise, the, the prophet wrote, He said, God said, I'm going to put a new spirit with you. I'm going to give you my spirit. And he said, I'm going to give you a heart of flesh and not a heart of stone. And I'm going to, I'm going to give you a, put my spirit in you. Oh, what a promise. What a promise. And, and of course, we know that came to pass in the New Testament when Jesus came into the world. And after that, Jesus died, rose uh, on the, rose again and then ascended into heaven. Forty days later, the Holy Spirit came. Ten day, approximately ten days uh, that they were in prayer and the Holy Spirit came. And the Bible says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And the idea of God imparting this gift into the world, into the lives of men and women. God gave us His Holy Spirit to indwell us. Yes, to, to dwell earthen vessels. That, that's even, uh, that's even uh, a greater truth of the fact that God did not send His Spirit to indwell some kind of supernatural vessel, but He, he sent His Spirit to indwell human flesh. To, even in the weakness of our flesh and blood, His Spirit dwells in us. Jesus is the beautiful example of this, the, the Son of God Himself. The Bible says He took upon Himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. The fact that Jesus Christ came in human flesh. As a, as a child in, in the manger of Bethlehem. He came in human flesh and he took upon himself human flesh. And that God spirit rested in him. And he gives us this example of how we live and walk as physical beings. In a super, with a supernatural spirit indwelling us. Number four, God expects in, in this concept of what God thinks about our body number four is God expects me to take care of my body he says know you not that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you if any man defile the temple of God that's a very very important concept that it literally says to us that we can defile the temple of God we can defile these bodies by the things that we allow to come into them. He says, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And we are to, we are to really consider this. This is, this is a very important thing that we as Christians should consider when we're, when we're confronted with temptation or when we're going through life and we're, we, we know we need to take care of this temple. We know we need to treat it right. We know we need to put the right stuff in it. And yet, 
many people don't think about the fact that God's word says that your physical body, your earthly tabernacle is his dwelling place. It's his temple and that we should take care of it. And God calls it holy. Why is it holy? Because it not because it's flesh and blood, definitely. But what makes it holy is his presence. His indwelling makes it holy. So when the Bible says, be ye holy, even as he is holy, how can we do that? Here's how that happens. It happens because his spirit indwells us as believers. And by that indwelling spirit, it makes that vessel holy. Flesh is not holy, but the spirit makes it holy. And that's why Paul would write, be holy even as he is holy. God expects us to take care of these physical bodies. He, he expects us not to, Bob says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. The Bible tells us that, that we're to take care, daily care of, of these physical bodies. That we should not overeat. We should not overindulge in things. But that we should use moderation in all things. The Bible again challenges us to, to stay away from things that defile or destroy or hurt our bodies. And uh, it, we, we understand that. We understand that in, in, in a, even in a physical sense. Or in a medical sense, how vital it is for people to take care of their bodies. And not to do things like, like drinking and, and smoking and using uh, drugs and, and other things. Because those things destroy that temple. They destroy the body. And God tells us the, that temple is God. Number five, and I, I won't spend any more time there, but I, I think it goes goes hand in hand with the concept of fasting, about caring for this physical body. Number five, God will resurrect my body after I die. That's a, that's a biblical truth. God will resurrect my body after I die. First Corinthians. See, here's the thing. We're talking about the resurrection, and Jesus, uh, Jesus talked about it. Paul writes about it here in 1 Corinthians 15 when he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, he's talking about the rapture. He's talking about the catching away. Written to us by Paul again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 when he says the Lord is going to descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ are going to be raised first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Here Paul writing to the church in Corinth, not the church at Thessalonica, but the church at Corinth. And he says similar words, but in a different context, he's saying, listen, he says, you're our, our bodies are the temple of God. And he said there's going to be a bodily resurrection. He says we're going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. This corruptible, which is flesh, must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption. And this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written... Death is swallowed up in victory. Well, he's talking about physical death and he's talking about the death of the, the human body. He's talking about the death of this fleshly, earthly house, this vessel. And he says that the truth is that that's going to be spoken is that death is swallowed up in victory because of that body that is subject to physical death is going to be victorious when it's resurrected. Death, physical death of the body is swallowed up in the victory and the truth of Jesus Christ that, that our earth, earthly vessels will be resurrected. And what a powerful thought. He says then, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is the victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, as we talk about fasting this evening, as we talk about 
the body relative to fasting that Paul was very clear, Jesus was very clear that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit and that we're to consider that as we live our daily lives and when we're fasting, it becomes an integral part of the consideration. We're putting aside the desire for physical things, the, the feeding of the physical body, the desires of the, the flesh to really focus on spiritual things. But it, but it, it still affects the body. And it's, it's well understood that periods of fasting are healthy for the body. It gives the body and the metabolism of our bodies an opportunity to rest. It's basically like a Sabbath for your body. Fasting is like that Sabbath, that day of rest for your body. Um, I've read stories, many stories of different people who, who fasted. I, uh, I read stories of, of pastors and ministers from ages past and who, uh, who fasted. Some fasted every, uh, one day, a certain day every week for most of their lives. Uh, it, just whatever God lays on your heart, whatever God makes available to you and his spirit leads you to do, to be able to fast, to be able to focus on spiritual things. It's very, very uh, healthy and it's very very spiritually nourishing as well. So why do we fast? Let's talk about why we fast. Uh, I want to give you three reasons. Three reasons for fasting. Number one, we give up food to feast on God. We give up food to feast on God. We fast from our physical desires in order to satisfy our cravings for God. Did you realize tonight that deep within each of us is a vacuum? It's a, there's, a, there's a place, there's a vacuum for God that only He can fill. It's a, it's a desire of the soul for God. And of course, we know that as time goes along, as people pack their lives full of sinful pleasures and sinful desires, that thirst for God, that hunger for God gets suppressed. And sometimes it gets so so deeply suppressed and so far so far uh, suppressed in our lives that it's very sometimes it's very difficult for people to once again to reconnect with that soul's their soul's desire for the living God. Fasting provides disciples opportunities as kingdom disciples opportunities to truly seek God. Um, in Psalm 42, the psalmist David, uh, I love this scripture. Uh, this is coming from the message. Uh, it's in Psalm 30, 42, verse 1 and 2. The message uh, translation, it says, A white-tailed deer drinks from the creek. I want to drink God, deep draughts of God. I'm thirsty for God alive. I wonder, will I ever make it arrive and drink in God's presence? The King James Version says it kind of like this. It says, as the heart panteth for the water brook, even so panteth my soul after thee for the living God. See, the, the idea of that young gazelle-like deer called a heart in, in the Judean hillside, they roam the Judean hillsides, and you will see them near the different places. Uh, I, I was in En Gedi, Several years ago, right near the Dead Sea, not too far from Masada, uh, I remember being in Engedi. En Gedi is the place where David, if you remember the story, David fled from Saul as he was fleeing, and he he um, he stayed there for a while at Engedi. And the reason was because there was a wait an oasis there, and it's right in the middle of the the desert, and it's not again not too far from the Dead Sea, and so Dave, David stayed there because there was a great water source well the the young heart gazelle like deer come there they make their way through the judean hills and they come there to drink and to find water well that's a long journey and and david understands that very clearly he's writing psalm 42 this psalm of david and in psalm 42 he he's remembering 
how often he has seen these young deer make their way across the hillsides and come into En Gedi or come into the oasis and be panting uh, for, for water. And David, David just takes that and he makes a spiritual application to that life experience. And he says, as the heart pants... For the water brook, even so panteth my soul after you, God. David realized that his desire for God was just as strong as the desire of that young deer who had had a long journey through the desert and who was almost dying of thirst. His soul had the same kind of desire for God. He says, my soul panteth after you. We have to understand that there is a desire in us for God. And that desire comes out of the soul. The soul is the, the self-consciousness. The soul is that consciousness of, of who I am and what I'm doing and where I'm at. The soul is that self-consciousness that makes me understand, understand my relationship to God and where I stand before God. It, and even though the world may see me one way, yet I know who I really am. I know what I've done. I know what I haven't done. I know my sin or I, I know the things that are in my life. And when you realize that, the soul, that part of us has that desire and that yearning for God. Only insofar as we eat and drink flesh and blood, the flesh and blood of the Son of Man, do you have life within you? Jesus said to the disciples one day as he was uh, having communion with them, he said, if if you don't take this communion, you have no part with me. The, we know that the bread represented his body and the, the grape uh, juice or the wine represented his blood. And he said, you must partake of this. Why? Because this represents my body and my blood that was shed for you for the remission of sins. Even when we think about this intensified pursuit of God. That Jesus becomes the bread from heaven. That he is the bread from heaven sent down to feed our soul. And we understand from the scripture that the father has sent him. Jesus said, he said, I am the bread of life. Jesus, we know that was born in the town of Bethlehem. The town of the word Bethlehem means house of bread. And I don't have time to get into a lot of that theology, but I just want to share with you this, this thought. We're, t we're talking about giving up food to feast on God. To feast on God. From physical desires to be able to satisfy our cravings for God. But what, what does diet medication, diet pills, or diet things do? They suppress your what? Craving. People spend millions and millions of dollars because we overeat, we overindulge in the physical food. And so we want to lose weight. And that's okay. A lot of people want to do that. Maybe all of us at some point in our lives want to lose some weight. But what, what, do, what do those pills, what do diet pills and those kind of things do? They suppress your cravings for food. They suppress the body's desire to eat. Interestingly, interestingly, there are things that come into our lives that suppress our hunger for God. Let me let me share just share this thought with you. When you when you when you Find yourself in the place of where Jesus said in the last days in Revelation chapter 3 that you would find even believers. He said you would find them in this condition. That they would be spiritually fat. They would be spiritually fat and fed to the point that they would say we're rich, we're increased with goods and we have need of nothing. And when we find ourselves like that, we, our hunger and desire for God becomes suppressed. The Bible says, to whom much is given is much required. 
when when we let the things of the world or we let even even the and over the overindulgence in spiritual things get us to the place where we feel we don't need God anymore then our hunger the true hunger of our soul has been suppressed it may be suppressed because of fear because of depression because of anger because of unforgiveness there are a lot of emotional things that can suppress your hunger for god and you know that i know that that when we're when we're how many of us know that when we're angry and we're upset and we're enraged we don't have a desire for God. We have a desire for vengeance. We have a desire to get even. We have a desire to, to let our, our peace be spoken. But we don't have a desire for God. Why? It's suppressed because of anger. Or when we're so depressed or we're, we're so into self, we're so, we're so into the things of the world, that hunger and desire of our soul becomes suppressed under those things. Paul said, lay aside every sin, every weight and every sin that does so easily beset you and run with patience the race that is set before you. When we come to the door of God's house, we should, we should empty ourselves so that we can come in and so our soul can find, can find that place where our soul can reach out and in desire find God. My soul. My soul, David said, as the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee. Where is that desire for God? Where is that searching for God? Where is that passion for God in the 21st century culture? It's missing. And the reason it's missing is because we live in such an affluent society. We live in affluence. Until you've had the opportunity to walk the streets of, and walk into the villages, the, the villages of places like, like Africa and India or, or places like Haiti and around the world into those places of, of ultra poverty stricken people. Until you've walked in those places, sometimes it's hard to relate to the reality that such poverty exists. But we live in an affluent society we live in an affluent nation we live in a nation where we we work toward retirement and we lay up for ourselves money and goods and things for the future and i'm not saying that's wrong but what i'm saying is this if we if we allow that too we have to be careful because if we allow that to we we forget our dependence upon the living god we're rich we're increased with goods. You say, well, Pastor, where is that? That's in Revelation chapter 3. And it's the letter to the church at Laodicea. And the Lord Jesus says to that church, you are rich. And you, you, say, you say you're rich. You say you're increased with goods. And you say right now we just don't need anything. God, we're, we're so blessed we don't need anything. And God says, listen, you don't realize you're naked. You don't realize your nakedness. You don't realize your emptiness. All, and, and he says... He says, I, I would rather you be hot or be cold. I'd rather you be hot or be cold. But because you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. The concept of lukewarmness is that place where we have no desire. We lose our ability to desire and we lose our ability to spiritually dream. And we're just somehow coasting through this thing called life. Church lacks expectation. Church lacks excitement. Church lacks anything. The coming together of the body of Christ seems to lack for us. And we don't get, we say we just don't get anything out of it anymore, Pastor. And the reason you don't get anything out of it, because when that appetite is so suppressed, you have no desire. You can't find any food to satisfy you if you have no desire. Have you ever been out to eat? My wife and I do this frequently. I know, I know everybody does it. We'll leave church on Sunday morning. 
We get in the car and we say, oh, well, where, where would you like to go eat? Well, anywhere. Anywhere is fine. Let's go anywhere. It doesn't matter. And my first thought, so I suggest something. I said, well, what about this? And my wife would go, eh, no, I don't really want to go there. And then she'll go, well, maybe we could go here. And I, eh, I don't really want to go there. Well, what happened to I don't care? <laughs> Let's just go anywhere. And we usually spend 15 minutes just trying to figure out a place where we might think we might want to go eat. And we're still not sure we want to go there. They understand if you were starving, you wouldn't care. But you see, we're so affluent. We're so blessed. We're so blessed in America that we spend a half an hour trying to figure out where we're going to eat. There are nations in this world where people get up every morning and children get up every morning. And and their question is not, where are we going to eat? Their question is, are we going to eat today? We rarely... I don't know that I've ever questioned in my lifetime, am I going to eat today? Is there going to be something available to me to eat? I've never faced that in my lifetime. Thank the good Lord. But I would tell you there are millions and millions of people in this world today that when they get up, they do not know that they're going to eat that day. They have no expectations. And I guarantee you they don't sit around and think, well, You know, well, which restaurant are we going to today? No, they're just trying to think of the first place they might find a morsel of food. See, when you're my spiritual man, when we become so engorged on the blessings of God that we forget who gave them, we'll lose our appetite. I wonder sometimes if that's why God doesn't send calamity. I wonder sometimes if that's why God doesn't doesn't allow pestilence to happen. Why God doesn't allow drought to happen. And why I wonder if that's not why at times God allows things to happen as he does. Just so somebody's going to wake up one morning. They're going to pray, God, this is a mess we're living in. God, we just depend on you today. We don't know where the next meal's coming from. We don't know if we can pay our bills. But God, it's been a tough week. It's been a tough year. But oh God, I know one thing. I trust in you. And that's what God wants to hear. The Bible says, faith. God loves us to live in trust. The Bible says, faith pleases Him. And where there's no fight for anything, where there's no struggle, is there faith? Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. Or excuse me, the, the substance of things hoped for. How many of us wake up at any day hoping for anything? You say, well, Pastor, I don't hope for much. I've got everything. Well, you are blessed. The evidence of things hoped for. the su- Excuse me, I keep getting that back. The, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. We don't live in expectation much anymore, do we? But we understand that fasting enables the believer to feast on God, to literally eat the, of, of the Lord, our craving, our desiring Him, wanting Him, receiving Him, enjoying Him. And that's what fasting does. If it does anything, it lays aside that physical desire, the desire of our flesh to feed our flesh, to take the time to feast on God. The end is not to lose weight. The purpose of fasting is not to slim down. The purpose of fasting is focus on God. The purpose of fasting from the physical things is to be able to feast on the living God. To get the desire to to embrace Him, to, to partake of Him. Very, very important. Number two, we fast to humble ourselves before God. The Bible records two instances when people fasted. First, people fasted to express sorrow over their sin. But unlike today where repentance is often sadly understood as nothing more than sorry, Lord, true repentance involves deep sorrow over sin. 
The Bible says godly sorrow worketh repentance. Godly sorrow. People, especially God's people, fasted. Secondly, to plead for God's mercy. People in dire need fasted. Nations sought God's mercy through fasting and prayer. What happened to Nineveh? Nineveh was under the judgment of God. God sent the prophet Jonah there and said, we're going to destroy Nineveh. I'm going to destroy Nineveh. And he said, and God was so merciful to that city. He said, Jonah, I want you to go there and I want you to preach. Because, because of their sinfulness, they, they deserve destruction. And Jonah, of course, decided he would go a different way. But in the end, God got him to go where he was supposed to go. And the Bible says the city of Nineveh repented. They humbled themselves. They put on sackcloth and, and sat in ashes. And they, they humiliated. They humbled themselves before God. Fasting is about humility. Humility. When I'm, when I'm filled and I, I can't breathe because I've eaten so much, that's not a feeling of humility. The feeling of overindulgence. God, God wants to, to have time with us to, as we humble ourselves under the mighty power of God and allow Him to minister to our soul, to our spirit man. We fast to humble ourselves. The Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of God and He will exalt you in due season. The scripture writer writes, Paul, in Philippians 2, verse 5, he said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who took upon himself the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and humbled himself unto death, even the death of the cross. Listen, Paul said, listen, you need to think like that. You need to have this kind of mindset. You need to think like Jesus did. He had everything, but he was willing to lay it aside to do the will of the Father. How many of us are there? How many of us are really there? Give up everything. Give up the, being at the right hand of the Father as the eternal Son of God, to be co-creator of the universe, to be at the throne of God with God the Father and God the, the Holy Spirit. And he gave all of that up and he humbled himself. And then to, to, to exaggerate his humility, he took upon himself the form of humanity. God who was spirit took upon himself the form of humanity and somehow, and he sequestered himself into a human body. I don't know about you, but that's quite a feat for, for the eternal God. God the Son to, to surrender his eternal, his universal essence, his universal power, his, his omniscience. His all-knowingness, His omnipotence, His all-powerfulness, and His His omnipresence, His everywhere presence through the Spirit of God. And He surrendered all of that in, to come into human flesh. I don't know about you, but that's, that, that's an amazing feat. I can't quite wrap my head around that totally. But that's the, that's a... The great example of humility and my question was this. Are we willing to, to set aside all these self things? Are we willing to lay it all aside and surrender to His will to accomplish His will in our lives? That's what fasting is, all, is about. It's about laying aside what I want, what I desire, what my flesh desires. You know, Paul said there's basically two things are going to are going to be the major battle of your life: your body, your flesh, and your spirit. Your your flesh is going to war against your spirit, and your spirit against your flesh. And with that being said, there comes a time when you have to put this flesh under submission and subject it to the spirit and the power of God. 
and give God the opportunity to work supernatural things in your life through the Holy Spirit. Fasting is about humbling ourselves before God. Thirdly, we fast to become more effective in life and ministry. We fast to become more effective in life. You want your life to be better? Then take time to fast and pray. Take time to lay aside personal desires and personal agendas and give God time to do His bidding in your life and accomplish His will in your life. Fasting is like defragmenting a computer. We all know what fragmentation in a computer is. The idea is that you have this amazing machine that has all this amount of amazing memory. But as you keep putting little things into it, those little things that are take up the memory, they go here and there and there. They come into the computer's memory called the, the hard drive. And then there's a, a random access memory called the RAM and that, that memory. And this stuff just gets thrown in there as you put it in on a daily basis. At some point, all of those things become, they're fragmented and you get these different gaps between all of those little programs and those little things that you've placed in your computer, millions and millions and millions of pieces of information. And it really begins to bog your computer down or slow your computer down. Defragmentation is the, the process of where your computer goes through and it picks out all of those things and it realigns those files to where the computer's processor can move smoothly through them instead of having to go here, stop, figure out what this fragment's about and then go there and figure out what that fragment and this fragment and that fragment and try to work through the, all of that to get to the information you're looking for. Where if it's defragmented, the processor can move slowly, smoothly through the files, find what it needs, and then begin to operate it through your processor. Our lives become fragmented, church. Our lives become fragmented. Our lives become filled on a daily basis with thoughts, with hurts, discouragements, with decisions, with good news and bad news with Facebook and Twitter and, and all the different things that come into our minds and our spirits on a daily basis. And, and all of that stuff gets thrown in to us. And we become, we become sluggish. We become spiritually sluggish and, and we have trouble focusing. And the reason we have trouble focusing is simply because there's just so much in there and there's no organization to it. And we fast, we fast because when we fast we have the time to focus and that allows us to then put some kind of sense into our, into our life and existence. We be, we're able to take time to reason and understand. And allow ourselves to organize our thoughts. Fasting is like defragmenting that computer. It's necessary. It enhances the performance. Fasting provides a similar effect to the spiritual life of a believer. Isaiah 58 quotes God's promises to those who fast the right way. And the blessings of fasting according to that. Let me, and, and we're going to go to Isaiah 58 again here in just a moment. But before we go there, let me just say this. Fasting by itself has, has very limited spiritual significance. Now hear, hear me out. Fasting by itself would have very little spiritual significance. The idea of just doing without food. Why? What do people do all the time to lose weight? Do without food. You can, you can fast. Matter of fact, fasting is a common term among weight loss professionals. You'll have periods of fasting and you'll have periods where you can eat what you want to and different things. But, but the concept of fasting is, is not necessarily a spiritual thing. Is the point I'm making. Fasting, yet practice with spiritual purpose 
blesses us tremendously. And I want, I want you to find that in, in your heart. And those of you who are listening in tonight, hear that. I want you to find that in your life. A day, a time when you can just fast with a spiritual purpose. And if you're on a weight loss program, this is not about your weight loss program. This is about laying aside something you desire. Matter of fact, if you're in a weight loss program and you're fasting already or you're doing without things you really want to eat already, well, you're in a context of fasting. Well, that's not that's physical. It's not spiritual. Well, maybe you need to fast television. Amen. Maybe you need to fast something you really enjoy. Lay it aside because all that's doing is feeding your mind and your flesh and it's just, it's fragmenting your, your existence. Lay it aside. It's something that you just do, do more than you do anything else. Maybe you need to lay that aside for a little while. And give God time to speak. Give God time to, to work through your life. That's, what fasting is about. Matthew chapter 6 verse 16. Jesus said when you fast. Don't be like the hypocrites. Don't follow their example. Because they're just fasting to be seen. They're fasting so that people will think they're spiritual. Right? Have you ever met people like that? Have you ever been around people that. Uh, that wanted you to know they were fasting. That just felt like it was. It made them more spiritual because they were. Jesus said that's not, the, that's not the point of fasting. He says when you fast, you fast to fast before the Father. Who's, who's your audience for fasting? Your audience is the Father and Him alone. He's the only one that needs to know you're fasting. Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, we read the story and, and I don't have a lot of time to spend with this, but in Daniel chapter 1, we read the story of Daniel and uh, how that he would not eat, and, and I'm going to paraphrase this just so we can move for, through it much more quickly without reading all those scriptures, but you turn to Daniel chapter 1, and you read Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, and you'll read where Daniel fasted, and what was his fast, Pastor Renfro? He was given a portion of the king's meat. In other words, he was in the king's palace. He was there to be trained as a servant of the king. Daniel, along with other young men like uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were three other young men who were being trained in the king's palace. These well-favored young men. And, they, of course, they changed their names to try to make them more Babylonian. But in the, at the end of... At the end of this thought, Daniel says, when he's offered the king's meat, he says, no, I can't eat that. Though it's been offered, I can't eat it. I can't eat that which... And Daniel, in his mind, knows something. I can't eat that which is offered to idols. I can't eat that which is not considered clean. I can't eat those things. Daniel says, I, I'm going to, I choose to forego that. Not because he wouldn't have liked it. Not because necessarily he wouldn't have liked meat or, or something that was offered. He simply says, I've got a higher purpose here. And they would only eat his fast. Of course, we even to this today, we do what we call the Daniel fast, which is basically eating, eating vegetables. And Daniel would not eat of the, the finest meats from the king's table, but he would only eat that vegetarian diet. The Bible says after a period of time that he and those that joined him fared much greater. They had much greater uh, even physical condition than those who did eat the king's meat. And so they were allowed to, con to, to continue on with that diet and not surrender that conviction in their life. That's what fasting, how fasting can affect our lives. In their case, it was about their conviction. It was about things that they believed in and that they lived for. And they said, we're, we're willing to give up the finest. We're willing to give up the, the great meats and the, the things to eat of the king, king's table. We're willing to give that up because we've got convictions. There are things we believe in and 
There are things that we must fo- have focus on. And boy, did Daniel ever need clarity in his life. He didn't need of the fragmentation of all the finery of the king and, and everything from the king's power. He didn't need all that cluttering his mind because he was con- confronted with some very, very powerful needs when he was in Babylon. And God gave him some of the most powerful and amazing revelations recorded in Scripture. Those didn't come because Daniel had his Daniel was was gorged with the king's meat. They came because Daniel had made a he said, I will not eat of the king's meat. He had conviction. He had purpose. And that purpose allowed him in that future to have clarity of mind and spirit. And God was able to give great revelation through Daniel's life. And I attribute it. Partially to the fasting that Daniel said he would not defile himself with the king's meat. Powerful. Let me give you something here. I want to just break in right here. And I know we're, we're kind of at the end of where our study guide is. But I've got a couple of things I want to share with you tonight just before we close. Number one, I want you to find something to write. I want to give you seven prophetic promises For those who give themselves to fasting, prayer, and repentance. And those are the three key things. Fasting. Along with prayer. In line with repentance. And as you know, we have set September the 26th as our in collaboration with. Uh, the event that's going on in Columbus, Ohio, the event that's going on in Washington, D.C. Uh, we have set that September the 26th as a day of solemn assembly. And I want to talk to you about that a moment before we close tonight. I want to talk, I want to show you how that ties in with fasting. First of all, I want to give you the seven prophetic promises for those who give themselves to fasting, prayer, and repentance. And we have been talking about, Jesus said, and when you what? Give, and when you pray, and when you fast. Those three priorities Jesus gives kingdom disciples in this Sermon on the Mount. In just this one part, just the the first part of this chapter 6. Powerful sermon Jesus is preaching, isn't it? Fasting, prayer, and repentance. Now, those who give themselves to these endeavors, these priorities, will find the following promises. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Joel. The book of Joel, chapter 2. And I want to walk you through a few verses. I'm going to get my Bible here. You get yours. Follow along with us in Joel, chapter 2. Joel, chapter 2. The first, the first one I want to talk about in Joel is the first part of the promise, Joel chapter 2, verse 19. Joel chapter 2, verse 19. Listen to the words of the prophet. He says, Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. He didn't just say he was going to send the corn and the wine and the oil, but he said he was going to send it in sufficient amounts to bring satisfaction. That's, that's huge. He then says, and I will no more take you or make you a reproach among the heathen or those unbelieving nations. Those who did not believe in Jehovah God. He said, you will no longer, I'm going to take away the reproach. The disrespect. I'm going to take that away. They're not going to look at you and and, and make fun of you. They're going to look at you in awe. Because of the living God you serve. He said, I'm going to take away their reproach. Remember when, remember when Israel, when, remember that when Nehemiah, was in the palace and he got the report from three of his brethren who came to visit him. And he, he got the report and they said, Jerusalem, the walls are burned or broken down. The gates are burned and, and the, city of, the city of Jerusalem is in, in reproach. We're a hiss and a byword to the, to the heathen around about us. 
Well, why? They were making fun because, you know, look, look at the condition you are and who's supposed to be your God. Well, God told God told through the prophet Joel, he said, listen, those who and it's predicated by God's call to prayer and repentance and fasting in Joel chapter two. But he says, if you if my people are called by name, humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. I'm going to I'm going to do some things. And he says here in Joel chapter two. Too. If you pray and you fast and you repent, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take away your reproach from among those unbelieving people. They're going to instead look at you with great respect. You know, the, the Bible tells us that, the, that when the children of Israel were getting ready to go into the land of Canaan, that the children of Israel didn't go in for that first 40 years because of unbelief, the Bible says. And they, they sent 12 spies in there. Those 12 spies came back and... Uh, Ten of them said, we look like grasshoppers in their sight and the cities are great and they're walled and they eat up the inhabitants thereof and so on and so forth. And, and they had this, they had this total wrong self image of who they were in the sight of their enemies they had forgotten how big their god was and yet 40 years later when they go back and they they're getting ready to go into the land and they send two spies and they go to talk to rahab the harlot rahab told those two spies this she said 40 years ago when they can't when they were coming over 40 years ago we we trembled when we heard about the people of god that our knees shook when we heard of the things that Jehovah God did for his people. No, you didn't look like grasshoppers. You were terrifying in their sight. They were terrified of, of the people of Israel. See how, see how wrong a self-image can be when it's based on how we see things instead of how God sees things. He says, listen, oh, the blessing in Joel 2, 19. Here's what he says is going to happen. Just follow along with me. You, number first, the yoke of poverty is going to be broken. The yoke of poverty is broken here in verse 19. I'm just going to, I'm just giving you four things that I see in this verse. Secondly, I see that divine provision will be released. Poverty broken. Oh, listen to this. Divine provision will be released. Can you, can you see this? If we fast and we pray and we put aside our own personal things for the sake to seek the living God, what God does is God, God divinely releases provision. Bible says, my God shall supply, said, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. When you fast, when you pray and you seek God, pro, pro, divine provision is going to be released into your life. No wonder the psalmist said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You don't need to want if divine provision has been released. This is not name it, claim it. The difference is this costs you something. You have to fast. You have to pray. You have to seek God. You have to put your own personal desires aside for the, of the flesh so that you can seek spiritual things. But when you do, the promise is that God, divine provision is going to be released. Poverty in your life will be broken. Every need can be met. And chains on your finances will be broken. There's many people that want... They're, the bondages of finance broke broken in their life. People are in bondage to debt. They're in bondage, and they need that bondage broken. It's it can be broken if we put ourselves to to prayer and fasting and seeking God and repenting of our selfishness. Repenting, you know, it's wrong to to go out there and and buy all these things we cannot afford and and things just because we have desire and and we have excess and want. The problem in America today is not. The greatest problem in America is not poverty. The greatest problem in America is not homeless. The greatest problem in America is excess. Amen? It's excess. We have access to too much. And if we can't afford it, we don't have the money in the bank to get it. We can put it on a credit card. And the Bible says when, when, 
And I, I'm going to get just a little aside. But it's necessary because you need to see where we are in the end time. But the Bible says when the, the scarlet woman came up out of the sea. When this vision of John in the book of Revelation. And he's going to during the tribulation period. What he's going to see is this. He's going to see a nation of peoples who have drunk the wine of her excesses. The scarlet woman represented Represented the spirit of Antichrist in our world. The spirit of excess. The spirit of want. The spirit of indulgence. And the Bible says the world was drunk with her wine. The wine of what? Past her excesses. Materialism. Consumerism. If you can't, if you can't afford it, just put it on credit. Listen, why? Because you deserve it. Listen, I don't, where's, where are those subliminal message, messages coming from in our life? Well, I will tell you they're not coming from God. God's not going to tell you to go out there and to put your family in terrible debt so you can have something you want, not necessarily something you need. God's not going to do that. The Bible tells us don't don't be in don't be in bondage to the lender. It's a bondage. It becomes a bondage. I believe God's people ought to seek to get out of debt, not to get into debt. Amen. That's verse 19. Let's go to the next one. Joel 2:29. Just write down Joel 2:29. Joel 2.29, the scripture says, And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out of my spirit. That's an Old Testament promise of a New Testament anointing. The Old Testament anointing was anointing oil. The Old Testament anointing was the anointing of the priest when he poured the oil upon the head out of the ram's horn. You with me? This scripture is a, an old, in the Old Testament, but it is about a New Testament anointing. He said in, he's talking about, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my spirit, verse 28, upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see vision and upon my servants and upon the handmaidens in those days. What days, Pastor Renfro? The last days. Before the coming of Christ. The last days of the church age. He says I'm going to pour out my spirit. A New Testament anointing. He didn't say he was going to pour out oil upon their head. That's Old Testament anointing. He said I'm going to pour out my spirit. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a metaphorical picture along with a biblical revelation of truth. I'm going to pour out. That's the metaphor. As in oil being poured, right? He said, I'm going to pour out, but the, the spiritual truth is my spirit. I'm not pouring out anointing oil. I'm pouring out my spirit. New Testament. Why? Because in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he promises the Holy Spirit. In, or, in Luke 24, 49, he promises the gift of the Father, the promise of the Father, and then in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost after they have been in a time of prayer and fasting. About 10 days of prayer and fasting. And this Holy Spirit, the anointing is poured out. Well, that's the fulfillment of Joel, clearly the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. But it's not the only fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. But I, I believe... Many of our last day's outpourings are a result of Joel chapter 2. Or are the fulfillment, excuse me, of Joel chapter 2. So Joel chapter 2 verse 29. Look, uh, first of all, the strongholds of the enemy will be broken and divine deliverance will be released. Heaven's resources are open. Rain from the parched land equivalent to spring he said i'm going to give you the the former rain and the latter rain you remember that scripture what does that mean pastor well actually what it means it means i'm going to give you rain in in a parched land where there there 
is no water and where there's always drought and famine. He says, I'm going to give you rain that is equivalent to the spring and the autumn rains combined. Well, what does that mean, Pastor? Well, it basically means this, that your harvest is going to be double of what it normally is going to be. See, we think we look at the rain and say, oh, well, thank thank God for the rain. That's a, quite a blessing. You know, that rain was for a future harvest. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit was not about the day of Pentecost. Are you with me? The pouring out of the Holy Spirit was not about the day of Pentecost. Hallelujah. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit was about the future Amen. Of the harvest of souls where the Lord would say, I want you to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, teach them to observe all things whatsoever of command you. Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the earth. And then he said in Acts 1 and 8, and you shall be, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. This idea of the latter rain, in Joel chapter 2, verse 23, he, he says it there. He says, be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. He's talking about abundance and blessing as a result of fasting. What's he? Because in Joel chapter 2, he calls the people to a solemn assembly. And a fast. The land is healed and becomes productive. Along with that the spiritual reign of God's power and presence. In Isaiah 58 verse 11 it says. And the Lord shall guide thee continually. And satisfy thy soul in drought. Well did you hear that? You got to get it. You'll miss it if you're not careful. You probably already missed it a dozen times. As all of us have. He said I will satisfy your soul in drought. He didn't say it satisfy their flesh in drought. My flesh is what, by, oh, hold on a minute. My flesh is what you would think would get thirsty if there's no water because of drought, right? My flesh would get hungry if there's a drought and no food to be found. Think about it. He didn't say it would satisfy their flesh in drought. He said it would satisfy their soul. That's powerful. And make fat thy bones. There's your physical blessing. In other words, he said, I'm going to give you, I'm not just going to satisfy your physical man. I'm going to satisfy your soul. He satisfies my soul. What's my soul, my heart, my mind, my intellect, my will, my understanding, my emotions. He's going to satisfy all those things in drought for those who fast and pray. Joel 2.26, prosperity is promised with overflow. I read that, Joel 2.25, divine restoration. He said, I'm going to restore. Verse 25, he says, look at it. He said, and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. I'm going to restore all the years of pestilence that the enemy, the enemy has destroyed. Restoration of all things. Divine restoration in Joel 2.28. I read it. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The outpouring of God's Spirit. And seventh is Joel 2.29. The manifestation of God's power. He says I'm going to pour out my spirit upon flesh. The manifestation of God's power. So he calls seven holy convocations. Or solemn assemblies in the Bible. And this is where we close tonight. I'll give these seven to you. And we'll, we, we can, if you have questions, we can even talk about them next week as we open up the Bible study before we move on to the next part of this, the, the next chapter. But all of the solemn assemblies, a solemn assembly, a solemn assembly is a special time God said, I want you to set apart. The purpose of the solemn assembly, a solemn assembly was basically a time when they would, they would do no work. It would be a, it would be, there would be no work, a day of rest, total commitment of the day to God, total focus on the things of God. It wasn't, it wasn't a day for us to just kick back and do family stuff. That wasn't what the solemn assembly was about. 
there are only certain places they were called in the scripture. And all of them relate to the seven major feast days God gave his people. Write down Leviticus 23, Leviticus 23, 1 through 8. Leviticus 23, 1 through 8. Read that scripture. And it's God talking about the Holy Convocation. The Sabbath of rest, the Holy Convocation. He said, you shall not do any work. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. He says, now, I'm going to paraphrase this and give you the seven solemn assemblies that the scripture talks about. There were only seven. Number one, the first day of Passover was the first one mentioned here. The first day of Passover. Passover was the commemoration of the passing through of the death angel when God delivered the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. The first day of the commemoration of that one year later, the first day of that Passover feast, of which there were seven days, the first day was a holy convocation. It was a solemn assembly, no work, fast day, total focus upon God. The first day of Passover, which was the 15th day of the first month, the 15th day of the first month. The second one, the seventh day of Passover was the second solemn assembly called in Scripture. The seventh day of Passover. So remember, every year, every year, the children of Israel, on the first day of Passover, they are calling a solemn assembly. Remember what Joel said in Joel chapter 2? He said, I I want you to, he said, sound the alarm. Sound the trumpet in my holy mountain. Call a solemn assembly. Bring the people together. Bring the children. Bring the bride and the bridegroom out of the bride chambers. You bring them all in. This is a solemn assembly. This is not a want to. It's a have to. It's not by choice. You've got to be there. You've got to show up. This is a solemn assembly. It's a fast day. No, no, no work. He says, and you, you bring them all into the house of God and, and, We'll probably end up in Joel chapter 2 there again later. But he says the priests are to come in. The priests don't minister like they normally do. They're to be on their faces weeping before God between the porch and the altar. Well, the porch and the altar is in the outer court. That's not even in the holy place or the holy of holies where the priests are. The priests are out with the people. Did you hear that? The priests are out with the people on the porch and the patio, so to speak. The priests are out there weeping before before God saying, God save the nation. That's in a solemn assembly. That's in a holy convocation. So the second one was the seventh day of Passover, the 21st day of the first month. 21st day of the first month. The third third one was the third holy convocation or solemn assembly called in Scripture was on the Feast of First Fruits. Or otherwise known as the Feast of Pentecost. It was a holy day. A day of fasting, day of prayer, day of rest. Focus upon God. The Feast of first fruits, The day of Pentecost, 50 days after Passover. Number four, the Feast of Trumpets. Which was the first day of the seventh month. The first day of the seventh month. Now when I'm talking about the first day of the seventh month, I'm talking about on the Jewish calendar. The first day of the seventh month. The Feast of Trumpets. Number five, the day on the day, the fifth one was on the day of atonement. The day of atonement was a holy convocation. As a matter of fact, the day of atonement was the holiest day in the Hebrew calendar. It was the day in which the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. He would take the blood of a lamb off the altar. He would take it in a basin along with a hyssop branch. He would take it in behind the veil into the Holy of Holies, which would be the only time he would go behind there in a year's time. He would go behind there, sprinkle that blood with the hyssop branch on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant for the atonement of the sins for the people of Israel for one year. That would be repeated every year on the Day of Atonement. It was a holy day. It was to be a day of fasting, a day of prayer, and a day of total focus upon God. The tenth day, seventh month. On the tenth day of the seventh month was the day of 
atonement. The sixth one mentioned in scripture is the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. The first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. It was on the 15th day of the seventh month. Five, five days after the end of the Day of Atonement. Five days later was the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Of course, you know that the Feast of Tabernacles represented that they, they made themselves booths. Uh, and they, they stayed in these booths during that time of the Feast of Tabernacles to commemorate of course, their, their, their uh, journey with God and how that God had led them through the wilderness and how that God had tabernacled or, or lived or dwelt among them as the people of God. It was the, the Feast of Tabernacles, the 15th day of the seventh month. And then number seven, the last one of the seven feasts, the eighth day or the seven holy convocations or solemn assemblies, the eighth day of tabernacles. On the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, again was another day of fasting. Day one and then on day eight. Between the two, they feasted. They enjoyed the, 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 the time together. But then on the last day, the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles was a day of solemn assembly or holy convocation. Fast, pray, focus on God. 22nd day of the seventh month. And there, the, these five characteristics, and we're going to pray, but these five characteristics are, cover all of these solemn assemblies or holy convocation. Now, here's the point I want to make very clearly. Solemn assemblies were not just something they it's not it, solemn assemblies were not just spur of the moment kind of flippant things they decided they wanted to do. Solemn assemblies or holy convocations were surrounded by the feast of the Lord that God had given to Israel for the commemoration of his work among them. The point I'm making here is, is this that when we're talking, we're talking about this whole solemn assembly we're calling on the 26th. We're talking about the, even the concept of a solemn assembly or a holy convocation. We're talking about that day of fasting and praying and repenting and seeking God, making it a day about Him. Is this that what distinctively char were characteristic of the solemn assemblies were these five things. Number one, it was mandatory. Everybody had to participate. Everybody. Wasn't, wasn't voluntary. Number two, so in my opinion, it's all, we're calling it a solemn assembly on the 26th, but it's, that's almost, that's almost the wrong nomenclature. <laughs> Because a solemn assembly, biblical solemn assembly, everybody had to participate. It wasn't voluntary. We made it voluntary. That's the point I'm making. I think everybody should be here. Number two, it was a time of fasting, as has been said. Number three, it was at a regular specified time, not random. And here's the key. Why wasn't it random, Pastor? Because it was always covenant related. Every solemn assembly was covenant related. The solemn assembly in Joel chapter 2 was covenant related. It was the promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It had to do with the new covenant in Jesus Christ and the promise of the comforter of the Holy Spirit that he would send. It was still about covenant. So... Solemn assemblies, holy convocations were distinctive because they were about not random events, not random times, but regular specified times that were covenant related. We know that the Feast of Passover was covenant related, right? We know that the Day of Atonement was covenant related because it's all about the new covenant in Christ and, 
and his atonement for the sins of the world. Every one of those feasts are covenant related. Number four, they were times of rest. No work, but here's the key word for the day of rest. No distraction. If you're not bothering to feed your face, you're not distracted to eating physical food because you're focusing on spiritual food. You're focusing on God. You're focusing on your desire for Him. And then five, what made these solemn assemblies, these holy convocations all very, very distinctive was they were times of repentance. They were times of repentance. Amen? God bless you. We'll pick up there next week. We're going we're to be finishing chapter 6 and moving into chapter 7, the last chapter the Sermon on the Mount. Thank you for being a part of our Bible study tonight. Thank you for, for tuning in. Those on Facebook, thank you for being here tonight. And uh, I, want, I want us to just close in a word of prayer as we uh, focus on the Lord for a few moments before we are dismissed. Father, we thank you tonight. I thank you for your word. We thank you for the powerful truths of the word of God. And especially, God, this uh, this three chapters in the New Testament and Matthew's gospel recording the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' sermon and teaching on the concept of God fasting and how that fasting God was about us and about us putting ourselves in a place God we can focus on spiritual and supernatural things not nat- just not the natural world. But God, I pray tonight that you would help us see the truth and the power of the word. And I pray, God, that there are going to be some people out there that are listening, some people here that are listening, God. And we're going to apply these things through our fasting time that we've set aside on the 26th, this solemn assembly where we're coming together for prayer and fasting here at Evangel. God, we're coming together to pray and to repent and to fast. God, we're doing it. God, in response to the call of God and how the Holy Spirit has been working. God, it's connected to the new covenant of Jesus Christ. It's connected to the new covenant. God, in the, in the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, tonight as we leave this place, I pray your blessing upon each family and each home. God, that you would bless those that, have, that tuned in tonight. God, some nugget of truth, God, in, has inspired their life. And God, in the days ahead, they're going to find the power of prayer and fasting and repentance in their life. And they're going to see you do miraculous things. You're going to turn their lives around. You're going to, oh God, make great change where change is needed. God, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for these that have been with us tonight. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. Come back Sunday morning, 11 a.m. Next Wednesday, 7 p.m. God bless you.